Coming up on DTNS, Samsung's almost indestructible Galaxy phone. Get a free upgrade to Windows 10. Force GDPR compliance from websites. And do we need a troll score on Twitter? This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, January 13th, 2020. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We were just reminiscing about Star Wars and where we saw the first movies and what we thought about them and what order people should watch them in on Good Day Internet. Get that wider conversation. Become a member and support DTNS at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Instagram updated its video loop maker Boomerang to now include editing options. Users can now trim clips as well as add slow-mo, echo blurring, and rapid rewind special effects to videos. Once a video is captured in Boomerang, users can click on a new infinity icon to select the editing options. OnePlus CEO Pete Lau announced the new Fluid Display. It's a Samsung-built 2K AMOLED screen with that refresh rate that everybody was saying it was going to have 120 hertz butter smooth the display promises a thousand nits of brightness support for 10-bit color and will use motion smoothing memc technology loud didn't announce which device will be the first to get the new display but it will go into something asus also announced an nvidia rtx 2070 graphics card specifically designed for intel's nuc ghost canyon platform which was announced at ces the Asus graphics card package is just shy of eight inches long, features a dual fan design to keep it cool, available worldwide on January 8th. Asus says the new GPU's shroud, heatsink, and heat pipe layout were designed to make the most out of the mesh side panel in Intel's chassis. All right, let's talk a little bit more about a couple of things, one <laughs> official, one not, from Samsung. Oh, boy. Samsung announced a tank of a phone, the Galaxy X Cover Pro, a ruggedized mid-range Android phone with IP68 and ML MIL-STD 810G certifications. That means it can withstand dust, water, extreme altitudes, temperatures, humidity, and more. This is a rugged phone. It also includes a removable 4,050 milliamp battery. Yeah. The phone features a 6.3-inch 20... 2220 by 1080 display, Exynos 9611 processor, 4 gigs of RAM, and 64 gigs of internal storage with a micro SD card slot. It also includes two rear cameras, 15 watt fast charging, two programmable buttons that can be mapped to push to talk apps like Teams, an EV, uh, EMV level one certification to accept NFC credit card payment with the phone accepted into Visa's tap to phone payments pilot program. The phone ships with Android 10 in mid-2020 for $499. Hey. In related news, XDA developers published images that says they are of the Samsung Galaxy S20 Plus expected to be announced on February 11th. The images show four cameras, a microphone, and a flash on the rear. No dedicated Bixby button, though. Yeah, I, I know this uh, XDA developers leak was uh, on top of every page today. Uh, and it's a, I know people are excited and like, oh, it really is the S20, I guess. And to me, I think, you know what? I'm fine waiting till February 11th to find out all the details about it. But I, I get that, that people are excited and it's like, oh, it looks interesting. They're going to have a microphone in the back that might make it so you can do that zoom in sound that Samsung's been talking about. But I'm way more excited about the Galaxy X Cover Pro. I, if you didn't catch it, what Sarah said was EMV Level 1 certification lets you accept NFC credit card payments. So you can use this as a point of sale out in the field. This is definitely being targeted at industrial workers, field workers, that sort of thing, because it's super rugged. And I kind of want one, honestly. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, what? when I <laughs> emphasized $499, I was emphasizing that because for all of these specs, given, you know, what the, the, the ruggedness of this phone, this is a really good price. Yeah, I mean, it's not great on the internal specs, right? Eh, 4 gigs of RAM, it's fine. 64 gigs internal storage, fine. 2220 by 1080 display, fine. You know, Exynos 96, fine. It's all fine. But what they did on the outside yeah. for the extreme altitude, the extreme humidity, the IP68, you can drop it from, I think, four meters. I might have that wrong, but you, you can drop it pretty far. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and man, that's just not having to worry about whether this phone's going to break on you. 
Uh, and the fact that it can take payments, uh, you know, I mean, sure, you can take payments with lots of things with a dongle and everything, but it's just, it's built in. It just, it's just makes it nicer. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm very curious. I just want this because it looks rugged and looks cool. I bet we have people in the audience who want this because it solves an actual problem for them out in the field. And I'd love to hear from you at feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com because that, that, that's, that's where this sort of thing really starts to make sense to all of us, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Well, folks, a survey of consent management platforms, or CMPs, by MIT, UCL, and Aarhus University found that 11.8% met the minimum requirements of GDPR. If you're like, wait, what's a CMP? It's a it's basically a, a piece of software sold by a company. There's about five major companies that say, okay, your website needs to be GDPR compliant. We're going to sell you this platform, which will make all those pop-ups happen. Like, do you want cookies to comply with the GDPR? You know, select your options here. Uh, so this research team looked around at 10,000 UK websites uh, and found they were only 11.8% in total compliance. That meant no pre-checked boxes, making rejecting all the cookies as easy as accepting them, and when you gave consent, it was explicit, not implicit. GDPR requires that consent be informed, specific, and freely given without pre-selected boxes. Well, 32.5% offered consent by user action, like scrolling or not responding. That's not explicit. That's implicit consent. 56.2% offered pre-clicked consent boxes. When right there in the GDPR, it says you can't pre-click the consent boxes. 50.1% of sites did not offer a reject all option. You would have had to go dig through into the settings and reject them all individually. Uh, of those that did offer a reject all button, 74% buried that reject all two clicks away. Uh, whereas accept all was always available on the first thing you saw. In their study, they found that having the opt-out be on the second page increased consent to tracking by 22 to 23 percentage points. If I had to dig in to click it, I was less likely to click it. They also found an indication that presenting the option when you wanted to get on with something else, like I want to read a story, oh, wait, I got this pop-up, and, and and that, in addition to seeing options over and over and over on multiple websites, it m makes the user pay less attention to their choices, and they're not necessarily making the best choice. So to solve that, the authors have designed a plugin that works for Firefox and Chrome, and they have the uh, open source code on GitHub called Consent-O-Matic that lets you choose what your consent choices would be in general, and then it can automatically apply them for you so that you don't have to get upset about a cookie banner and you don't have to worry about digging in to find out where all the option is because they took the five biggest suppliers of these consent management platforms and coded the extension to work with them and do it all for you. I think that's great. I do too. Uh, that said, if for whatever reason you don't know about the plugin, maybe you haven't heard of it, maybe you don't care, maybe you don't you don't wish to um, to, to, to give folks an option, what is going to be the recourse for websites who are not GDPR compliant based on, you know, th these stats, which, which lead us to believe that many, many are not. You mean what's going to happen to the people who aren't in compliance? Yeah, Why aren't they like, getting yeah, busted? Like, <laughs> yeah, right. Like, yeah, like, like who's going after them besides yeah. to tools to make you GDPR compliant? That's great. But if you don't, uh, if you, if you don't take advantage of it, like, are, are you in trouble? Who's going after you? The regulators say that they are, uh, they're trying to figure out the best way to go after this, uh, and, and target, uh, websites that ha are causing effective harm. Uh, so I think what they mean by that, it sounds like it's kind of gobbledygook, but I think what they mean is there are way too many for us to go after at once. So we're trying to figure out which ones will have the most effect. If yeah. we bust a couple of people, will that cause others to get in compliance? It, you know, which ones are causing the most harm and, and are being the most egregious about not following the rules? But it's a huge enforcement problem because you have so many sites that at least according to this research, do not appear to be in strict compliance that I think what's happening is the EU is saying, well, it's better than it was, and we just need to figure out a manageable enforcement mechanism that will move others into becoming compliant because they just don't have the manpower to try to bust 
90% almost 80, 88.2% that aren't in compliance. Yeah. Um, I predict that, uh, if if enforcement kind of comes into play a little bit more, a lot of sites will be like, oh, well, thank you, Firefox, for your wonderful plugin to, <laughs> to make us more compliant because it 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 helps take the pressure off of the developers on that yeah, side. Yeah, it's, it's Firefox and Chrome. If anybody Chrome yeah. managers are wait, wait, I don't know. You get it. You, e either of you get it. And I highly recommend it because that way you're exercising your rights. You're, you're effectively answering the question properly and it lowers your frustration so that you're not just clicking okay because you're tired of it. I, I think it's a super good option for people. A uh, Liverpool-based gamer, Aiden Jackson, was talking to a fellow gamer, Dia Lathora, who lives in Texas in the United States, when Jackson experienced a seizure. Now, Lathora knew Jackson's address but didn't know his phone number, so she tried the emergency number of the EU, but that didn't work. So she found the non-emergency number and she called that. Police and an ambulance did appear at Jackson's family front door in Liverpool. Jackson's parents said when the police arrived, they had no idea why. He was upstairs, they were downstairs, they didn't realize what was going on, but their son was indeed unresponsive. He was experiencing a seizure and Lathora, in Texas of all places, was the one who alerted the entire family to this fact. I love this story because it's an example of uh, gamers being good to each other, That's people right. on the internet being helpful with each other, and someone going above and beyond. I mean, Lathora would, I think, be forgiven by most of us if she just said, "Oh my gosh, uh, I, I don't know what to do. I, I can't hear. I can't hear you. It sounds like you're having a seizure," and just and, and just hoping for the best. Uh, but but she didn't. She went above and beyond yeah. and and did did research and tried to get through. Now, I mean, I think that's a testament to how well these two people like each other and and the kind of relationship they have. Uh, these aren't just, you know, fly by night gamers who happen to meet today. They they right, obviously right. have shared they information. Were because she, yeah, yeah, she knew the address and everything. So that helps. But uh, yeah, I you know, we don't get enough of these kinds uh, of stories. And I and I think they happen more often than people suspect. And, you know, as somebody who <laughs> I have my own uh, experience with epilepsy, this sort of stuff, if if, if you know how it works, it, it does tend to happen, you know, when you're alone a mm -hmm. lot and nobody knows and you're either OK or you're not. Um, but it is very serious. And the fact that um, uh, Mr. Jackson was, you know, having a seizure, he was in the house with his parents. Parents didn't know, you know, he's upstairs playing games. You know, they're used to that. Somebody uh, very far away saying, hey, we, you know, we, 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 we need to deal with this. Um, somebody needs to go to his house. I'm going to do everything in my power and in, 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 in order to make that happen is, yeah, it's very heartwarming. And I think it points out that there, and, and again, I'm not going off the deep end and saying there ought to be a law, but uh, I think it would be great if somebody came up with a solution. Maybe it's a, a plug-in. Uh, maybe it's just a standard that that sites like Twitch uh, could could put in, or, or gaming sites could put in to be like, hey, if I if I need emergency services, make it easy for me to figure out what emergency services. And I know the immediate objection would be like, well, that could be misused because of things like swatting and all of that. Uh, but, but obviously, you know, Lothora had a little difficulty and spent a little time trying to figure this out. It would be, it'd be nice if there was an easier way to be able to, to call in a report like this. Um, I'm, I'm not saying there should have been or that anything's wrong because there wasn't, but it shows that there might be a good use for that. Absolutely. Official support for Windows 7 ends Tuesday, January 14th. That's the day after we're recording this episode. That means no more security updates. That means you should not be using Windows 7 after Tuesday, January 14th. <laughs> now, you may say, Tom, that's great, but I don't have the money for a new Windows. Uh, there are ways to extend. Now, if you're a big enterprise with a contract, uh, you can probably get some new security updates. You can probably get all kinds of help from Microsoft. But if you're a home user, the Windows 10 home operating system costs $139 for the upgrade. However, you don't need to pay the $139 legally. It's, this is not an illegal thing. There is a free upgrade tool from Microsoft. Now, officially, Microsoft stopped distributing the tool in 2016, but they haven't stopped it from working. To get it, you go to Microsoft's own site on a Windows machine, 
uh, you go to the download Windows 10 disk image page. There's a legal page on Microsoft's website that they are still supporting. You find create Windows 10 installation media and choose to download and run that tool. Then once you've got it running, you choose upgrade PC now, and that will upgrade the PC that it's running on. When the update is done, you go into settings, update and security, choose activation, and you will find your new legitimate digital license for Windows 10. CNET has all the steps on this. If you're like, wait, Say that again. I want to write this all down. Uh, go, go to CNET.com. We'll have a link in our show notes at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Uh, keep in mind, if you have Windows 7 or Windows 8 Home, you have to update to Windows 10 Home. And if you have Windows 7 or 8 Pro, you have to update to Pro. They won't let you cross. That is blocked. Uh, but it is perfectly legitimate for you to go and do this and save yourself $139. Did you have anything running on Windows 7? No, I do not. Uh, I, I actually, I do have I, one I machine on Windows around XP, my house as well. but it's almost, not all. I, I was almost hoping, I'm like, there's got to be some Windows 7 something around here. Nah, no. it's all Windows 10 at this point, at least in my house. But I think that this will apply to, you know, some folks, especially with, you know, some older hardware um, and yeah, save yourself some money. The Competition Commission of India ordered an antitrust investigation into Amazon and Walmart-owned Flipkart, looking into allegations from a group of small and medium-sized businesses that the companies promoted preferred sellers who were either affiliated with or controlled by the companies themselves. The investigation will also look at the company's discount practices, and both companies deny the allegations. Yeah. I mean, in some ways you're like, this isn't new. I've heard of Amazon being uh, brought up on this before, but uh, it's happening in India right before Jeff Bezos is visiting to meet with government officials there to help try to open up that market for him. So he's going to have some awkward questions, I'm sure. Uh, and it's happening to Flipkart, which is a local Indian business, even though it is owned by Walmart. Walmart bought it, uh, but it grew up in India. Uh, it's just a matter of size. Once companies get these this yeah. size, they want to start using that size to their advantage. And when they think it's fair, some small and medium-sized businesses don't think it's fair. And that's when you need to have people investigate and decide whether it's fair or not. And, you know, we're talking about relatively new business, uh, you know, companies, right? The idea that, you know, somebody is going to be delivering food um, or, you know, the, the, that kind of gig economy type deal. You're going to see more and more situations like this where it's like, well, that company's doing really well. Are they, you know, are, is, is an abuse of power? Uh, you know, or, you know, are they within their rights to do so? And I think that uh, Flipkart, as successful as it has been um, in that particular market, is just, you know, one of, one of many companies that will be looked into. Well, and you'll also have situations where small business uh, takes advantage of an open platform like Amazon or Flipkart. Uh, and then as that platform grows and its own homegrown stuff starts to do better and the small business isn't growing as fast, they'll look at it and say, wait, is that fair? They, they, they're not helping me the way they're helping themselves. And that's what, that's, what's at issue here. Hey folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Wired has a publication of a Q&A with Kayvon Bakepour. He is the founder of Periscope and the head of product at Twitter. Uh, Wired talked with him at uh, CES last week. And in this Q&A, Sarah, he goes over a lot of interesting things about how Twitter is managed, how Twitter's trying to be a better citizen, how it's trying to make a better environment for people who use Twitter. The, the story is titled, It's Easy to Be a Jerk on Twitter, and Twitter Wants to Fix That. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Twitter is, is, is almost sort of like our best use case of a platform that works well, but also hosts a lot of abuse. And that's because of the way that the platform was set up before it had the, the, the you know, the, the as, as many people who use it as they do now and, 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 and the way that they've, the, the, it's, the user, it's because of unanticipated consequences. They didn't right. know they were going to get people in this amount of, of this number using it in this way. Exactly. I mean, even back to like, the, 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 you know, RT feature like that, that 
that wasn't even a Twitter thing. That was something right. that somebody just came up with and then everyone started using it. It was like, this is great. And then the company had to deal with it. And the company still has to deal with a lot of that stuff. What they have done as a company, as Big Poor describes, hiding replies as a new feature. We've talked about this recently. Uh, if, 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 uh, if, if there is an incendiary stuff that's going on within a conversation on Twitter, um, you, you now as a user have more options to hide those replies. Quoting tweets, however, and, and Big Poor is, is quick to point this out. They serve their own purpose. Quoting tweet, if you're not familiar or, or uh, if you don't use Twitter a lot is I, you know, if Tom says something and I want to respond, I could at reply to him or I could quote tweet it, which actually breaks the conversation and starts a new conversation. That's and this what is in, in reaction to not only hide reply, but also the new threaded conversation options we talked about last week, where you can say, well, the only people who can reply to this are the people I mentioned in the original post. Right. But if you quote retweet, anybody can comment it, on. it basically it, it it breaks the conversation and starts a new one yeah and twitter right. and twitter says we don't want to stop that that's okay you don't have to you know it's sort of like if if tom's have tom and roger are having a you know a christmas party and i knock on the door and they're like you're not invited you know i can still talk about it i'm not invited i'm not you in the original party, conversation Although exactly we would always, we would always and that you. and that's not always some nefarious reason for doing so it might be because you don't follow me or i don't follow you or you know that sort of thing so twitter has said okay we we understand that conversations are hard to follow we're trying to make them easier to follow we're trying to give the original poster of a conversation more tools in order to control the conversation you know so it doesn't get hijacked by a bunch of trolls um at the same time we understand that that's not how all conversations work and it's still okay for other people to start their own topic of conversation about an original poster's conversation even if that's a different Twitter conversation. Well, and and there was there was a point where Bakepoor said, uh, you know, we know that it's easy for people to become jerks. <laughs> uh, he says, yeah. here there really isn't a disincentive today to being a total jerk on Twitter, and that's a product problem. Uh, and then he and and from the guy from Wired, Nicholas Thompson, uh, started comparing it to ride hailing, and they said, you know, in ride hailing. There is a disincentive to being a jerk because every rider has a score that the drivers see. Every driver has a score that the riders see. Yeah. And like so if, you may yeah, decide, I don't want to take a ride acting. with somebody with only two stars. So Nicholas Thompson from Wired suggested, do we need a troll score on Twitter that, that shows just how good or bad you are on Twitter? And, you know, my my initial reaction to that was like, oh, gosh, this is a Yelp. Come on, man. But at the same time, the more I think about it, the more I think this actually might be a good thing. You, you know, you in the in the sense that on LinkedIn, uh, the people that you are connected to the people who give you nice accolades, who give you nice reviews, you know, who 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 um, who, uh, you know, are 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 talking to you online on that platform, that's sort of like a, that's a really good indication of kind of who you are as a person in the, in the corporate world. On Twitter, it's a very different game. I mean, and we all know this, like, you know, half the time on Twitter, I'm, you know, trying to make jokes or, you know, I'm liking other people's jokes and I'm not necessarily doing my day job kind of thing. But if I were acting inappropriately on a regular basis, I think it would be in everyone's best interest to know that I was doing that. Even if it doesn't, I don't know, like, even if I don't, you know, get features taken away from me just to just to have some sort of like, it's like an asterisk, right? Like, yeah, well, Sarah, you know, she's a little, she's a little sus, you know, in these uh, certain um, arenas, whether Although, it be, okay, you know, it, tech or sports or whatever. I think that that, that would be helpful to- Would it though? Because A, if it's done by users, then it's open to be gamed by users. People will start uh, organizing to label someone as a troll who's not being trolly. Yeah. That's a problem. And- if someone's a troll and they got a troll mark and they just keep trolling, they can be seen as a badge but, of honor. But, at what, that but point. what if the troll score is only determined by machine learning within the company? 
Well, okay, then it's a matter of how is that machine learning work? They, That's and, right. and they actually talk about this in the Wired article. Uh, Bakepoor says the way they determine what's toxic right now is they have very clear rules about what's allowed and what's not. And then they have a very large amount of sample data of tweets that violate the rules that they can use to train machine learning. Uh, it's easier to find rule violations than it is positivity. But if you're going after violations and toxicity, then machine learning is pretty good. It's not perfect yet. It's pretty good at finding that. So yes, yeah. maybe you let machine learning do that and it's resistant to the gaming of the system, but then you deal with the small False percentage, even if it's small, and, of people yeah. who are incorrectly labeled by the machine learning because it isn't perfect. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, I don't, I don't exactly know how Twitter intends to make this work. Well, they don't. Bakepoor said like, that's a really interesting <laughs> idea. And he never commented on whether they'd, they'd explore it or not. But I think, I think I, I, as much, many objections as I'm throwing in front of you, Sarah, I'm kind of doing it because I'm with you. I think it would be interesting. The reason it works on Uber and Lyft is everybody has a stake in it, right? You tend yeah. to want to give honest stars because you don't, you, even though they can't really do this, you don't want people to downgrade you as a writer. Like everybody's getting graded and it sure. could mean you don't and, get a ride. And, There's and a real consequence well. to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I don't it, know what the equivalent in Twitter is, like right. what the real consequence is. <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. What is the consequence of you saying to me, Sarah, you've just sent too many stupid tweets? Yeah. Do what they happens to me? The amount of tweets that you can post right. per day? Right, yeah, like it doesn't, it, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't affect my bottom line necessarily. Mm. Uh, it's 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 not sort of an economic, uh, you know, tit for tat type thing. Right. But, but at the same time, I think that, uh, there are, especially because I have so many people who are following lots of accounts that I don't follow. And, and I get, you know, I forwarded, you know, a tweet that's kind of out of thin air that I have to kind of try to parse and figure out where it came from and who's this person. And, oh, let's look at the bio and all of that stuff. If there was a rating system that worked and I'm not sure how it would, but if there was, I would welcome it uh, because they're, you know, it is still the wild west out there. Yeah. And the key, the key is making it work because I still see Twitter uh, on my, uh, on my mobile app where it blocks sensitive content, blocking things that I darn well know are not sensitive. So it's, it's not quite there yet. Well, thanks everybody who participates in our subreddit. Sometimes Twitter stories end up there. <laughs> you can submit your own and vote on others, things that you care about and you want us to care about as well. Dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. You can also join our conversation in our Discord 24-7. You can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, let's check in with Chris Christensen, the amateur traveler, who has a tip for those traveling domestically in the U.S. Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. If you're a frequent flyer, I'm sure you already know this, but for those of you who aren't, one trick is when you're flying, especially domestically in the United States, before you get on a flight, you should have the airline app, the latest version of the airline app, on your smartphone. Yes, it's convenient to have your boarding pass on there, but also many airlines are going with free Wi-Fi enabled movies, but you have to have their app to do it. And so on your devices that you may want to watch movies, you may want that. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. They should all have a current signed version of the app on the server on the plane too, I'm just saying. But yes, mm -hmm. that's a good tip, definitely. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. David from Brisbane, Brisbane Strong says, just adding to your discussion of wearables on Friday's show, David says, I work for a large Australian company, 14,000 employees, and in the last 10 years, I've worked for several companies with a large, highly educated office-based workforce. All have programs to raise awareness about well-being. All have done step challenges, like how many steps you can accumulate in a month, for example. I wonder if this has normalized and boosted the profile and sales of wearables, at least to those chained to a desk Five days a week. Yeah, those company programs like that can can really cause measurable increases. Absolutely. Uh, because it, it encourages a large number of people at once. So, you know, around 14,000 employees. That's not nothing, even if it's only a percentage of them that participate. So thank you, David. I love getting this kind of perspective. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Thanks, David. Also, shout out to our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Michael Keeper. 
Paul Reese, and Steve Ayadarola. All right. We have new Patreon reward merchandise to celebrate six years of DTNS. Len Peralta created a six-year anniversary DTNS logo. And if you back certain levels at patreon.com slash DTNS for three months, you can get either a sticker, a poster, a mug, or a t-shirt. Get the details at patreon.com slash DTNS slash merch. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We love your feedback. Keep it coming. We're also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2130 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Patrick Beja. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>